from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 52, recorded on February 3rd, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Hello, Paul. Welcome back. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we're going to take a closer look at Paul's most recent column, RFK Jr.'s War Against Cancer Prevention. So let's start, Paul, with what are human papillomaviruses and what do they cause? Right, so the human papillomavirus um, causes cancers, about 35,000 cancers roughly a year, two-thirds of which occur in women, uh, primarily cervical cancer, which is the fourth most common cancer for women, causing about 11,000 cases and 4,000 deaths a year. And the other third in men, uh, causing anal, uh, genital, head and neck, uh, and oral cancers. So it's HPV virus is a cause of cancer. It's a common virus. Usually about 80% of, of people by, say, the end of their fourth year in college or the equivalent of the end of their fourth year in college have, have acquired that virus. Most people get rid of the virus and nothing happens, but occasionally the virus uh, goes on to transform cells to become cancerous, which you will be, then see as a cancer 20 to 25 years later. And so it was Harold Zurhausen who made the link between HPV, certain HPVs and cancers, right? Right, for which he won the Nobel Prize, right? And that eventually led to making a vaccine. So we have multiple HPV vaccines. What have, what has been the effect of these vaccines on the cancers? Well, so HPV vaccine was first um, licensed in the United States in 2006 as a sort of four component vaccine. So it, it accounted for four of the many serotypes of HPV. Um, years later, there was an additional vaccine or a vaccine to replace that that had nine of the prevalent serotypes that caused uh, cancers as well as uh, anal and genital warts. So since then, at least in the world of cancer, we've had about a 62% reduction in cancers because of that vaccine. So the vaccine works, although when it was first introduced, remember, usually cancers occur 20 to 25 years later. So it was going to take a while to see what the impact of that was. The impact has been even greater in Australia, where they've had a greater uptake of the vaccine than here. In fact, last summer I was in Stockholm interviewing someone about these. They, the, the country, Sweden, has a a goal of eradicating cervical cancer with HPV vaccines, because that's that's all that matters for women. And it's the only known cause of cervical cancer. Therefore, it's doable. In fact, they have eliminated pap smears. All they do is a um, HPV PCR, and um, that's it. It's really remarkable. Mm -hmm. You write in your column... Perhaps no vaccine has been subjected to greater scrutiny. Why is that? So when that vaccine was licensed, um, the, it was it was a fraught time. So 2006. Um, so this is it really the first vaccine to be licensed that was preventing a a disease that was only transmitted by sexual contact. So that put the physician that who was now giving this vaccine to adolescents in in the position of. of feeling that they had to discuss essentially that, that this was a, a, a virus that was transmitted by sex, which was uncomfortable for some people. The other the thing I remember is that um, the George W. Bush administration insisted that one of the people on the advisory committee for, for immunization practices be a member of Focus on the Family. And I remember this well because he ended up actually heading that HPV vaccine working group. So focus on the family um, was of the belief that if you um, don't have sex before you're married and the person you marry doesn't have sex before you're married and you never stray from your marriage, that you're never going to get a sexually transmitted disease, which is true. But that defines a solid less than 1% of this country. So it wasn't really practical for a strategy. Um, that was one thing. The second thing that worried people at the time, as to, to the extent that there were studies done, was that um, this would cause people to be more sexually active, 
more promiscuous, if you will. And so there were studies done looking at that, which of course made no sense. I mean, it's like, you know, people when they get a tetanus vaccine don't feel they can run, run across a bed of rusty nails barefooted, you know, with impunity any more than this made sense. Because first of all, it's not gonna protect against syphilis or chlamydia or gonorrhea, or frankly, not all cases of HPV, not all serotypes of HPV. So that never made sense and it wasn't true. And the third thing that worried people was very quickly, people like Katie Quirk had um, mothers on the show or young girls on the show who said they were fine, they got the HPV vaccine, and now they're suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome or various rheumatologic diseases, autoimmune diseases, or uh, neurological diseases. And so that also caused, you know, many studies to be done, dozens of studies really to be done to see whether HPV vaccine was associated with those autoimmune diseases or neurological diseases, and they weren't. But in any case, it created a litigious environment, which was where Robert F. Kennedy Jr. stepped in. Now, in cases where vaccines cause problems, and you write about some bona fide cases like the polio vaccine and uh, Guillain-Barre, there is, there, there is a mechanism to get compensated, correct? That's right. So if you, if you believe that uh, the vaccine that you took harmed you, especially permanently, there is a system called the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. And you can then apply to that system. Um, lawyers are automatically paid whether you win or lose. They automatically get money whether you win or lose. And and if you're compensated, if, if the this panel of, of uh, lawyers and doctors determine that you, in fact, did have an injury that was caused by the vaccine, then you're compensated there. Now, if you, if you, if you, if the, this group decides that you, um, were not, um, suffering an actual vaccine harm, uh, or if the, the amount of compensation isn't, isn't something you think was fair, you can always then go to civil court and sue the companies directly. So the, the HPV claims to the National Child Vaccine Injury Act never went anywhere, correct? That's right. So it's really it's a panel of uh, three three lawyers who who listen to the data, listen to both uh, panels of experts present their data, and then they decided that the uh, the evidence did not support the notion that HPV caused these chronic diseases that were claimed. And and so RFK Jr. was involved in those, presumably. I'm not sure he was involved in that original vaccine injury compensation program uh, filing, but certainly he's been involved with this for a while, as were his sort of uh, friends who are also personal injury lawyers. I really consider Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to be a personal injury lawyer in terms of how he acts. Um, people like at uh, Wis Wisner, ha Wisner uh, Baum, which is a, a another uh, law firm, or Morgan & Morgan. These are sort of personal injury law firms. So you say that if you can't win in the, the Va Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, you go to civil court. And why is that easier for you? Uh, I'm not sure it's easier. The bar is pretty low, actually, in in, uh, in the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. If you can't win there, it's hard to win. The bar, in some ways, is higher in civil court. Um, so um, usually that's why it is that that Vaccine Injury Compensation Program really did settle things down with regard to vaccine litigation. And uh, you... You indicate that RFK Jr. makes money on these claims. According to his uh, his most recent uh, financial filings, which had to uh, be submitted because he is now being considered for Secretary of Health and Human Services, his principal source of income last year was from these kinds of lawsuits. That's remarkable. <laughs> In fact, you say his Facebook page says, if you're injured by Gardasil, call us. How would you know? Well, if you perceived yourself as having been injured, I mean, you know, this is why vaccines are a universal scapegoat, right? I'm fine. I got a vaccine. Now I have a set of signs and symptoms. Could the vaccine have done it? What's different? What's different about me? What's different about me is I just got a biological agent and maybe that did it. Tell us about the exchange between him and Elizabeth Warren during the confirmation hearings. Right. So what she did was she held his feet to the fire. She said, here you are suing pharmaceutical companies. You are now, to, now about to have a letterhead that says Secretary of Health and Human Services. This enables you to do some things. You could, for example, expand the list of compensable injuries, compensatable injuries through the vaccine injury compensation work, which would enrich you. You could take vaccines out of the vaccine injury compensation program, making it even much easier for lawyers to sue companies directly, which would enrich you. You could change the labels, which would enrich you. So she said to him then, after all that, are you? can you promise me that you will not then uh, continue to do the activities you're doing if you're head secretary of health and human services? And he initially said, no, I will not. I'm asking about 
fees from suing drug companies. Will you agree not to do that? You're asking me to not sue drug companies, no, and I'm not going to agree to that, Senator. No, you can sue drug companies as much not, as you want. I'm not going to agree to not sue drug companies or anybody. Now, the next day, he realized how bad that looked. So he, he changed his mind, and he said that he, he wasn't personally going to accept the money. He was going to give it to his oldest son. I don't see that as being very different. Oh my gosh! You know, in in other years, that would have been the end of the game. Right, we're not in those years. We're not in those years anymore. Oh my gosh! Now you say this could prevent women, of, or deprive women of of uh, the best way to prevent cervical cancer. How would that happen? Well, so if if it becomes onerous, burdensome for the company that makes this vaccine mm -hmm. to make it because of sort of liability. Uh, claims that, that go through in civil court, they could give it up. And, and this is where we were in the 80s. I mean, in, in the early 1980s, there was a, a film that came out called DPT Vaccine Roulette, um, which um, claimed that the uh, wholesale pertussis vaccine, which was used then, uh, was causing a variety of uh, neurological problems, i.e. brain damage, causing children to have seizure disorder, attention deficit disorder, um, epilepsy, etc. And those cases went to court, civil court. And, you know, the, by the mid-1980s, there was more than $3 billion in lawsuits. And the companies, you know, they were having trouble getting liability insurance. They were increasing the price of the vaccine, but that still didn't make up for it. And so they just said, forget it. We're out. And so the, although we had 18 companies making vaccines for America's children in 1980, by the end of the decade, that number had decreased to four. I think what people don't realize is how fragile this market is. I think we saw the COVID vaccines, which were no doubt windfalls for Pfizer, Moderna. Absolutely. But vaccines are something, for the most part, you give just only once or a few times in your lifetime. They're never going to compete with like lipid lowering agents or diabetes drugs or psychiatric drugs or lifestyle drugs. So... Um, it's a fragile market and companies can give it up. And if you make it onerous enough for them, they will give it up. And the reason this, uh, this particular sub stack had the title it had, which is uh, RFK Jr.'s War Against Cancer Prevention, is if we drive a vaccine like HPV vaccine off the market, um, then I think you're just going to see women once again having to worry about uh, having no way easily to prevent cervical cancer. What is crazy is that other countries realize the value of HPV vaccines and embrace them. Right. Australia probably being the best example. I think they have had more than 80% decline in uh, the instance of cervical cancer there. So this is um, a uh, cancer that causes 4,000 women to die a year in this country. Here's a way to prevent it. And by having these frivolous lawsuits, these nonsensical lawsuits in which RFK Jr. is involved, a man who, in theory, could by the next few days be the Secretary of Health and Human Services. It's just, uh, frankly, unconscionable. It's unconscionable for him to behave this way. I know you've said this many times, but this exchange with Elizabeth Warren makes it very clear to me what drives RFK Jr. It's not science, obviously. It's profit, and probably it's the same for all the other anti-vaxxers which is why they're always the first ones to call people shills. It's amazing. Well, you can read the um, column on uh, Beyond the Noise at Substack. We'll put a link in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.